Thank you uh, to the organizers. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Um, in, um, consistent with the, the way this panel was uh, advertised, I was going to try to uh, speak to, at least touch on some of the topics uh, that were uh, labeled, uh, touch on the standard of proof set by the Court of Justice in the Sony BMG versus Impala, uh, some recent developments in estimating the coordinated effects of mergers uh, and touch on some differences between Europe uh, and the United States. Uh, so to start um, with the first, with the Sony BMG versus Impala, it's my understanding that the uh, Court of First Instance has argued that for a finding of collective dominance, you would need uh, to argue that one, there's sufficient transparency to enable monitoring, two, that there are mechanisms for deterrence, and three, that there's no outsider disruption, such as entry or buyer resistance. The first point on transparency uh, seems to focus on the existence uh, of sufficient transparency to enable monitoring without any direct communication between the firms and without the firms having to put in place additional structures to facilitate monitoring. On the second point, uh, firms would typically uh, at least have the threat, uh, a mechanism for deterrence, that any coordination uh, would just end and that profits would return to pre-coordination levels. And on number three, uh, the focus seems to be on the, the absence of outsider disruption, um, not the incentive and ability of the firms to coordinate their actions so as to minimize the effects of buyer resistance uh, or uh, to deter entry. So it seems uh, from this way of thinking about uh, a finding of collective dominance that the primary concern appears to be tacit collusion in the post-merger market. I wanted to talk about some difficulties with tacit collusion. Uh, tacit collusion, truly with no communication, can be hard. Uh, tacit collusion requires an initiation phase in which the firms must come to be coordinated on some equilibrium uh, without communication. Uh, and then uh, an implementation phase where they have to follow through uh, again, uh, on, uh, on this agreement without uh, communication. So I, I have a, a quote here from, uh, that involves a number of our presenters. So this is uh, Ivaldi, Julianne, Ray, Seabright, and Tyrol saying that uh, while economic theory provides many insights on the nature of tacitly collusive conducts, it says little on how a particular industry will or will not coordinate on occlusive equilibrium, and on which one. Uh, and I agree. So I think there are, um, it can be difficult to have an initiation phase for tacit collusion without uh, communication. Uh, and on the implementation phase, uh, things can be difficult uh, if firms face strategic buyers. If buyers can play the firms off one another and create uncertainty in the minds of the firms as to whether the other cheated, uh, that can cause coordination to fail uh, if the firms can't communicate with one another to resolve this uncertainty. So in theory, there are some potential difficulties with organizing tacit collusion. Uh, and I want to offer some uh, data uh, that also speaks to some of these difficulties. Uh, this uh, graph is, I'm going to show you, is from um, some work that I did with Bill Kovacic, Bob Marshall, and Matt Rafe, and it draws on data from the vitamins conspiracy. Uh, so let me uh, describe to you what this graph is showing. Uh, the vitamins cartel involved collusion among very many different vitamins, and so vitamin A, vitamin B2, vitamin B5, vitamin C. And within each of these vitamins, there are multiple vitamin products. There might be a particular strength of vitamin A designed for livestock, and a different strength of vitamin A designed for human consumption. So there are many different vitamin products. And some of these vitamin products were produced by two, 
uh, cartel members. Some were produced by three, some were produced by four. So we have different vitamin products that are manufactured by different numbers of suppliers, different numbers of cartel members. And we know for each of these uh, products uh, what the prices were before, during, and after the period of conspiracy. Uh, there's a, a period uh, for each of these vitamin products that the manufacturers pled guilty to a global price-fixing conspiracy. So what this graph is doing is uh, on the axis across the top, uh, to the left of the center are uh, negative numbers. Those are months prior to the beginning of the conspiracy. So uh, a minus 15 there is 15 months prior to the beginning of the conspiracy. And the positive months to the right are months after the end of the conspiracy. And the entire decade of the conspiracy is collapsed onto the single point in the middle. And so what the graph is showing is the uh, change in price in the months prior to the conspiracy relative to the maximum price achieved during the conspiracy, and the prices after the end of the conspiracy relative to the maximum price achieved during the conspiracy. Okay, so when you look at the graph, you see uh, a large jump up from prices before the conspiracy to the prices that they achieved during the, the plea period, during the conspiracy. Uh, prices uh, before the conspiracy were 30, 40, 45% lower than the prices at their maximum during the conspiracy. And then you see after the end of the conspiracy, uh, there was an investigation uh, in Europe uh, and in the United States, uh, and you see, there was an amnesty applicant. And so you see the prices drop off uh, after the end of the conspiracy. Um, there are three lines on the graph. The blue corresponds to products where there were only two manufacturers, two cartel members manufacturing the product. And the other two lines correspond to products where there are three or four manufacturers of the product. Now, I, um, I take away a couple different things from this graph. One uh, is that if you have only two manufacturers, having spent 10 years working together in an explicit price-fixing price conspiracy makes it fairly easy for you to then continue tacit collusion uh, in, in the period after the conspiracy. But I think it's interesting, uh, even though many of the, the, the firms that are in these two, uh, two firm conspiracies, the firms behind the blue line uh, are also in the other two lines, even though they had just spent 10 years engaged in a very well-organized pricing conspiracy and had recognized enormous profits as a result, they were unable to sustain tacit collusion uh, after the end of explicit communication, after the end of the explicit conspiracy. After about a year, uh, prices are back to their pre-conspiracy levels. Uh, so one of the things I take away from this is that uh, even with lots of education on the profitability of collusion and how one might organize it, it can be difficult to sustain tacit collusion when you have enough firms in the industry. Oops. Let me just try to point one um, distinction uh, between the U.S. and uh, EC guidelines on coordinated effects. Uh, Section 7.2 and U.S. horizontal merger guidelines are quite similar to the EC guidelines, mentioning things about transparency and the ability of firms to monitor each other, mechanisms for deterrence, and having limited effects of outsiders, uh, like buyer resistance, uh, strong buyers. But the U.S. guidelines also consider prior express collusion. collusion. Uh, so they are still seemingly focused on the risk of enhanced ability of tacit collusion, although also bringing into play this idea that a prior period of education, shall we call it, on the value and uh, how-tos of collusion uh, might be useful. 
So I want to talk a minute about explicit collusion. Uh, and I think uh, one thing that doesn't seem to be highlighted uh, in the guidelines is uh, whether a merger might potentially increase the likelihood of explicit collusion. Uh, and so the... Um, a discussion of when the end of explicit collusion results in mergers is a topic for another day, but I'm going to think about when uh, uh, a merger might uh, increase the possibility of explicit collusion. So when is explicit collusion a greater concern? Well, uh, explicit collusion is hard work. Uh, you're going to need a self-enforcing agreement because you're not going to be able to rely on uh, the courts. You're going to have to keep it secret. Everybody in the conspiracy is going to have an incentive to cheat. Uh, but if uh, it's more profitable, then you have a greater incentive to put in place the kinds of structures that would be needed uh, to make it succeed. Uh, and if uh, it's easier to put those collusive structures in place, uh, then I would also think of it as a greater concern, uh, and also uh, if there's a history of explicit collusion. So I'm going to start with the first part here. Um, measuring the profitability uh, of collusion. Uh, I think of the profitability of collusion as affecting firms' incentives to solve the hard problems they would need to uh, in order to have uh, successful coordination. And one thing, uh, I have worked with uh, Bill Kovacic and Bob Marshall and Steve Schulenberg on methods for trying to quantify the extent to which a merger increases the profitability of collusion. And one thing you can think about doing is if you have uh, an analysis that you're using for thinking about unilateral effects, uh, you have a model, uh, you're, you're using uh, some of the tools that we've talked about today, instead of just thinking about the incremental effect of the merger proposed, you can take potentially, these tools one more step and ask, suppose they didn't only merge, it wasn't just the proposed merger, but additional mergers, uh, which would be uh, similar to thinking about perfect collusion among the post-merger firms. So instead of just thinking about the merger is five to four, so we consider that change, what if it actually is five to three? Because once you go to four, uh, two of the remaining firms will have a strong incentive to form an explicit car cartel. So you can use, once you have an approach, you can potentially use it to try to quantify incremental profits from coordination and incremental profits from deviations uh, from an agreement, which may give you some measure of stability. Uh, so there are um, uh, ways to think of quantifying potential profits from collusion that can provide a measure of incentives for collusion uh, and to quantify payoffs associated with deviations from a perfect collusive outcome to give a measure of the stability of a post-merger cartel. The second um, piece was whether um, it's going to be, um, how easy it's going to be for firms to put in place the structures that would be needed to successfully uh, collude. Uh, I think of the key problem facing uh, a cartel is deterring secret deviations. Uh, and in order to deter secret deviations, the cartel is going to need to put in place pricing structures and allocation structures and enforcement structures. Pricing structures are going to be uh, the, the mechanism by which they increase prices, reduce output, uh, reorganize incentives within the firm to make sure you don't have your own sales force undermining uh, agreements like allocations of customers or something like that. You'll need in place allocation structures, so some way to allocate uh, the collusive gain. Uh, and also, um, the cartel has to deter secret deviations. Secret deviations are a problem for an explicit cartel. But in the operation of a conspiracy, uh, there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be uh, things that come up uh, that are not secret deviations, they're, they're mistakes that have to be repaired. And so a cartel will typically all, also need some way of making the adjustments and the transfers uh, to try to keep uh, on track with their agreed uh, allocation. And you'll need enforcement structures. You'll need some way to monitor 
uh, and uh, you'll need some threat of punishment in place, uh, and that would uh, most commonly be um, uh, the, the threat that you return to the pre-collusive levels. Uh, I have worked with uh, Bill Kovacic and, uh, and Bob Marshall that we've been trying to think about what practices a cartel might engage in before starting to collude in order to make it easier on themselves to later put in place the collusive structures that they're going to need. And so we've talked about um, FIX, as in P-H-I-C-S, practices that help the implementation of collusive structures. Um, so the implementation of structures is going to be easier if the firms can do things before engaging in inclusion that increase their interfirm communication, um, engage in more interfirm transactions, more contractual relationships, things they can do to create an informational barrier between those in the firms who will potentially be aware of the cartel conduct and those who will not. Uh, and to provide high-powered incentives for short-term profitability to key individuals. And if there are inherent difficulties in doing these things, that suggests uh, greater difficulties in designing effective collusive structures. On the uh, third point of um, whether there is a uh, prior history of collusion, uh, I just thought I would... Um, just put up some summary of the extent to which you see firms engaging in collusion in more than one product. So this table uh, looks at the European Commission decisions between 2001 and 2012 and looks at cases where there was a firm that received a 100% discount based on leniency. So they, someone, uh, there was an amnesty applicant that was granted leniency. Uh, that were, uh, were the firms, um, all of these firms were uh, engaged in uh, two or more products and were uh, a, a leniency applicant uh, in at least one of those products. Uh, and you, you can see uh, a number of firms involved in inclusion in multiple products, uh, often uh, applying for leniency in multiple products um, and sometimes receiving partial um, reductions. If we go to the set of firms that have been engaged in three or more uh, pro cartels and three or more products but have never been the leniency applicant, it pulls up a, another set of firms. And um, let me just draw your attention to uh, a little more than halfway down it is listed AC Troy Hand. This is a, a consultancy uh, and they will run your cartel for you. Okay, so they're in Zurich, and so I just want to point out there are firms out there that stand, if, if collusion is profitable, there are firms out there that stand ready to help you um, make sure you capture those, those profits. And so there's a, there's a market for these services. Uh, so if collusion is profitable, then I, I think it's a concern. They, they were fined 1,000 euros in the organic peroxides case, but that uh, allowed um, the European Commission to establish the ability to, um, to levy fines on, a, on a, a firm like that. So this is my final slide. Um, my, uh, <laughs> let me just give you a scenario of concern. The European guidelines, my understanding is, do not, would not highlight potential concerns with a transaction that greatly increased the profitability of explicit collusion, that involved firms or products with a past history of collusion, but where prices appear to be non-transparent and where buyer resistance appears significant. Uh, so let me give an example. Uh, so there is a conspiracy uh, between 1988 and 2001 in industrial tubes. These are copper tubes and refrigerators. Um, and it's a, uh, it was a profitable conspiracy. They were fined, the group of them, on the order of 75 million euros. And this uh, quote from the European Commission decision says, general announcements for increases in prices in the industrial tube sector were not made due to the fact that purchasers were big industrial companies with which prices were individually negotiated once a year, 
No general price lists were applied, and attempts to create such lists failed. So if you were looking at this industry and you were worried about coordinated effects and thinking in terms of tacit collusion, uh, you might think, gosh, it's going to be really hard for them to monitor prices. Uh, they're going to have, there's going to be lots of buyer resistance. They've got these powerful buyers. Mm, doesn't seem like much of a concern. Uh, and, and maybe they wouldn't have been able to successfully tacitly collude, but through communications and transfers, they were able to put in place the structures required um, to successfully um, explicitly collude. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks.